Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Silk Road Rising, here the historic Chicago Temple Building. My name is Jamil Corey, and I am the founding artistic director uh, here at Silk Road Rising. And it is a great honor uh, to be presenting this panel discussion to you all, entitled "Dramatizing Resistance: Saadalla Wanus and the State of Contemporary Arab Theater." Uh, the late great Syrian playwright Saadalla Wanus is very much here in the room with us. Uh, this past weekend, we presented three staged readings of his play, Rituals of Signs and Transformations, uh, that was uh, translated from Arabic to English by panelists Neda Saad at the end of the table, and next to her, Robert Myers, uh, and directed by panelist Sahara Saad. Uh, we, with a support from a grant from the MacArthur Foundation, we were able to commission this translation, and so it is, um, uh, a special honor that we are helping to introduce one of the 20th century's greatest Arab playwrights to English-speaking audiences. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our distinguished panel. Uh, Sahar Asaf is a Lebanese theater practitioner and an instructor of theater at the American University of Beirut. Next to her is Riyad Ismat, an acclaimed dramatist and critic in the Arab world, currently a Buffett Center visiting scholar at Northwestern University. Nabil Khoury, uh, no relation, but same last name, Khoury, uh, is a senior fellow of Middle East and national security at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Robert Myers is a playwright and translator and a professor of English and creative writing at the American University of Beirut. And Neda Saab is an assistant professor of Arabic studies at the Lebanese American University and a scholar on Sufism. So welcome to our distinguished panelists. So the way the evening will work is I will begin by posing a series of questions to the panelists. And at, and at the latter part of the evening, we will open it up to questions from you. Uh, we'll start with questions that are sort of broadly about uh, Arab theater, and then become more specifically about playwright Wanus, and then we'll go broad again. Uh, my first question is for Riyad Ismant. Uh, the title of tonight's panel discussion is, of course, Dramatizing Resistance. Uh, to the, in today's Arab world, how is theater understood and utilized as an act of resistance against tyranny and oppression, uh, both social and political? Well, the Arab theater since the mid-60s and especially after 1967, uh, can be described as political in general. Uh, it's provocative, it's stimulating, uh, uh, it's educational, as we will find in the early plays of Buenos, and I think it helped in the concept of resistance, of creating resistance, but obviously uh, theater as any art form, or literature, it can do all this, but it can't change politics. It can change the awareness of people towards what's going on. I mean, it can do as in the time of Sean O'Casey, people would go outside of the theater for fist fighting, but at the end, it can't change regime or ty tyranny, but it can create an understanding, a better understanding and make especially the younger generations, you know, try to change in a legitimate democratic way to claim freedom of expression, to fight for their own human rights, uh, uh, to do uh, a step forward to, to, to be part of the advanced democratic world. So that kind of resistance is what Arab theater did since the mid or late 60s until today, I hope. Uh, Nabil, we, we hear a lot in the US media about a so-called Arab Spring and about conflict and upheaval uh, in various Arab countries, most notably Syria and Egypt. Are the region's social and political currents are, are, are shaped by the theater somehow, the Arab theater, or are they a response to, uh, or is the theater a response to the events happening around theater makers? In the case of theater, I don't think in the immediate sense. Um, I, I would say poetry uh, interacted more with the political movements uh, called the Arab Spring. In Tunisia, in particular, there was Abul Qasim al-Shabi's famous line about if, if people one day chose to live, then 
the night has to dissipate, the shackles have to break, the Shabu Yawman Arad al Hayat. That line in particular <coughs> was used repeatedly by the um, demonstrators early on. And it was uh, picked up, it reverberated immediately in Yemen and then in other places across uh, the Arab world. Um, it's a very motivating line and it begins with the people and then very quickly thereafter uh, the demonstrators started saying the people want the fall of the regime. So uh, there was a very direct uh, connection. In terms of theater, in Yemen ironically the theater was sort of uh, entertaining and motivating once people started gathering in squares then there was rap music and there was theater. In Yemen in particular, in different parts of Yemen, young people would spontaneously get up on a stage and put on plays. And many of them were spontaneously uh, put together. And they would uh, inspire, they would entertain, and they would keep the crowds in the squares. <coughs> Um, if, you, if you connect the, uh, these plays politically, they were reflecting uh, a spirit and keeping the, the motivation going. Uh, to connect politically and to c connect to tradition, you'd have to go way back. I think I would agree with Riyadh. You go back to the 60s, you go back to uh, theater that was more directly based on a tradition, more directly political and much of it was underground. And in that sense, took a long time before it motivated people towards uh, rebellion and revolution. Sahar, what about the reach of Arab theater? Is there, a, is there a big audience? Is there sort of an active theater going community in, in the Arab world? Obviously there are big pockets, sure. Beirut being one of them, but the, the reach and the sort of utility of, of the theater. Well, let me start by saying that although the Arab theater dates back hundreds of years ago, especially in the <coughs> forms of storytelling or puppetry or religious passion plays, but it's not it's yet to become a popular art form or entertainment form. We have very limited uh, theater houses, we have very limited audience numbers. Uh, the challenges, well, this has to do, of course, with the many challenges. In Lebanon, I speak in Lebanon because I practice uh, mainly my theater in Lebanon. Um, we have the economic challenge, we have the censorship, we have the continuous, unstable security situation, political instability. Um, theater is not, for instance, um, in the there's lack of theater culture, if I may say. For instance, theater is never a subject that we teach at public schools. Uh, so, well, despite all of these, if I want to just give you a you know, a general idea about the, the theater scene in Lebanon, you find uh, theater makers, despite the challenges, they keep on practicing theater. And I guess in times of conflict, actually, it thrives because there's a lot to say. There's th This is a medium that, uh, you know, you find as a weapon in terms of, uh, you know, being uh, an artist, an individual, instead of feeling helplessness, for instance, you go into the theater, I guess. Uh, so. In general, you, you have uh, plays that are adapted from international text, <coughs> international plays, classics. But what I would like to highlight perhaps today is the fact that theater is uh, you know, getting its way into the civil society. Uh, there is a general uh, raise in awareness today in Lebanon of the importance of theater as a medium. So you find all these NGOs now, recently, I'm speaking in the last five years or so, using theater as a medium for political and social change. Just this last Saturday we had a march on uh, women's rights, uh, actually in particular demanding um, a law that protects women against domestic violence. And at the center of the demonstration we had a, troop, a, a theater troupe, Zokak, the name is, performing a piece on the subject. So. I know it's not very dark, I think, the, the, the scene, but uh, definitely there's a way, long way to go yet. Yeah. I, I was always struck in the uh, 80s in particular in Syria under the late Hafsal Assad, 
uh, the, the use of theater as a political protest that the regime would essentially allow for, uh, but, but typically uh, plays were contextualized in a way where they were set in the 1800s and they were set in another era, and there was criticism of, of leadership or there was criticism of corruption, uh, and audiences would just burst into applause. There would be these lines that you could really clearly connect to a, uh, a, a direct criticism of the contemporary situation of what was happening you know, in, the, in the here and now. Um, but you know, that became the sort of the safety valve that you know, contemporary figures weren't being named. Uh, and I, and I, I was so impressed by how, how powerful that was and how important that was to those audiences. Yeah, and it's just, if I may add, in terms of impact and reach, actually, this kind of theater, the interactive, it, the, it, it uh, draws a lot from the theater of the oppressed or from drama therapy practices or applied theater. You're reaching out to the audiences. You're going to them. You're doing theater for them and by them. So in terms of the reach it, and the impact, it's much, much more powerful than traditional theater, waiting for the audiences to come to you. Robert, Sadallah Wanus, uh, tell us a little about this playwright that we've been spending quite some time with. Uh, Robert and we, we got to know each other about two years ago, uh, and it was the start of a series of conversations that led us to the commissioning of the translation of this play. Uh, and so we've had this kind of ongoing rapport about Sadallah Wanus and the broader Arab theater. Uh, I should also point out that we had the opportunity to go to travel to Beirut this past December to see the full production of Rituals of Science and Transformation that was translated and that, that Sahar directed. But if you could tell us some about the, the playwright that has brought us all together. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I should uh, say I'm quite humbled to be um, uh, on the panel. Uh, I'm principally a playwright, a literary scholar, cultural historian. Um, I had the great good fortune to uh, meet Riyad Ismat when I first went to the Arab world in 2001. I actually arrived in uh, Jordan um, to work on a play with uh, uh, a company there on September the 8th, 2001. And that was my introduction to the Arab world. I'd been there three days um, when the attack <coughs> happened in 2011. I subsequently went back, finished that project, and as I said, I had the good fortune to travel to Damascus and, and uh, meet Riyad Ismad to see the extraordinary uh, dramatic institute there, which certainly uh, helped to open my eyes. Uh, the other thing which opened uh, my eyes was uh, I had studied uh, uh, Spanish and Portuguese literature at Yale with Maria Rosa Minocal, whose work is principally on the, the role of, uh, of uh, Arab influence in uh, Spain and how it had been dramatically underplayed as a source of Western literature. And uh, uh, she's done wonderful work. Her name is Minokal. I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, so these two pieces of, the, of my experience led me to realize that I needed to educate uh, myself uh, in a much more profound way. And I would recommend to those of you who are interested in Arab culture in the Arab world, um, uh, uh, Sadala Wanus is a wonderful entree. And, and one reason why is that he very uh, self-consciously um, followed Bertolt Brecht, especially early in his career, in historicizing um, uh, theater and and uh, relating it to particular moments. Um, this was one of the dicta of Bertolt Brecht that uh, we do not live in a timeless world and that we have choices and that if you can construct a play that is about choices um, uh, it will make it clear that we have choice. It's also uh, a theater based on thinking uh, and not on empathy. Um, he uh, very consciously, he being Brecht, um, said, we need to think more. Juanus's background, um, interestingly, is more of a cultural journalist, a critic. It's not so surprising. You see uh, playwrights like Tom Stoppard, for example, the, the British uh, playwright, who's maybe the most accomplished of his generation, also began as a critic. But unlike a lot of other world uh, theater figures, 
uh, like uh, Shoyenka, Boal, uh, uh, Fugard, who began as actors, who began as directors. He was very much a thinker, very much an intellectual, very much what Gramsci would call an organic intellectual. He came from a peasant family um, uh, near the Mediterranean in Syria. Um, and his life is a wonderful way to trace key events uh, over the last uh, 75 years in the Arab world. Um, and it was very helpful to me to reread his work within the context of what's going on. Probably his most decisive uh, uh, and influential work, um, at least in retrospect, is his evening party for the 5th of June which uh, is a ferocious critique of uh, the duplicity of Arab leaders and of uh, sold out artists. Um, it uses a number of meta theatrical tricks. Um, it's quite humorous, but sort of deadly, bitterly ironic uh, humor. It's not conventional theater in any sense. Um, Formally, it was very innovative. You had actors who stood up in the audience. You couldn't tell who the actors were. You had somebody who actually played a, a playwright. You uh, uh, have uh, truncations of a play that's supposed to happen, but it never does happen. Some dopkey folk dancer performers come on. A peasant jumps up and says, I'm not being represented. Um, <laughs> Wanus very consciously hoped that this would ignite um, a political response, or so he says. And it was a theater of what he later would refer to as politicization, not just political theater, but as uh, Riyad Ismat was saying, like Sean O'Casey, that you would actually go to the ramparts. Um, and he produced a, no, uh, a number of other plays in the 70s, also very Brechtian, but drawing on elements of the East, such as uh, uh, Mamluk, uh, uh, the tale of Mamluk Jabber's uh, head, um, uh, which is, uh, draws on the Hakawati, or storytelling tradition, takes place in a cafe. It's, it also is very meta-theatrical. It has play within a play. It also draws on a very famous historical incident, the sack of Baghdad, um, but it's very innovative formally. Um, a parable, the king is the, the king, uh, uh, some people think it's modeled on Breck's man is man, in, in which a peasant becomes the king by simply being dressed up as the king. And then the wife, everybody else, the courtiers decide he is the king and the real king says, oh no, I'm the king. One is also, and I don't want to recapitulate his entire career, but a couple of other key moments are in, in 1977, he attempted suicide, he was deeply depressed. In part, he claimed in a docu documentary film later in life that it was because um, he felt that Sadat had betrayed the Arab people. Um, so this disillusion with leaders, leaders' duplicity is an uh, important motif in his work. He didn't write for 10 years uh, plays. And then um, near the end of his life, um, uh, about 10 years after this, he wrote a very controversial play called uh, The Rape al Tisab, which is, uh, uh, has a sympathetic Israeli character in it. Um, uh, he uh, wrote this play that we did here, Rituals and Signs of Transformation. He was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and he continued to write and said that, that writing plays um, saved his life. What's really fascinating is that, um, probably for our panel today, is that he, earlier in his career, he overtly wanted to use theater as a tribunal to affect political change. Um, these later plays, are compared to Shakespeare um, with good reason, or compared to Chekhov, um, as are Riyadh's. I've read some of Riyadh's plays, uh, uh, marvelously Chekhovian. Um, but they require the audience to decode the play. They don't have a clear message, and they're much more focused on the individual. The irony, of course, is at the moment of the so-called Arab Spring, um, especially this play that we did here, Rituals and Signs of Transformation, which is a very Shakespearean play. It's one that a lot of young people have um, responded to. 
um, as a dramatic uh, manifestation of, of their own desires for change in the Arab world. So you have this irony that early on he was doing overtly political work and later on he was doing you know, what seemed to be far more personal, individual, poetic work and yet um, that's the work that may um, be seen to have had the most profound uh, political effect. Yeah, I want to I follow that up with this idea that in, in Wanusa's work he's conveying a tension between collectivism, sort of collective identity and collective action, uh, and individual rights, individual freedom, and trying to somehow strike a balance, uh, particularly with the, the individualist discourse often being derided or dismissed or not being you know, fully embraced. Uh, if any of you would like to speak to, to the uh, issue. Yes. Uh, actually, the focus wasn't very much on the individual uh, person. Uh, but I think uh, when Nuss, in my opinion, especially in his early phase, he relied heavily on political projection. He used parables, like Bresh, like Robert said, from Bresh. He used different techniques, uh, some were borrowed from Pirandello also. And he wanted to have uh, uh, sim symbolic plays, but actually they were more allegorical, in a sense. Uh, uh, why? Because, of course, in the Arab world there is censorship, in one sense, and he he wanted uh, uh, to uh, to go deeper, you know, and uh, criticize, uh, 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 you know, without being censored or banned, uh, because he had the experience with an evening's entertainment, and it was prohibited for a year or two years. Uh, it was performed in Beirut and in Sudan. Then it came to Damascus. Uh, in 1971, and uh, it was his breakthrough. Uh, it was quite acclaimed, especially because the year before, two of his shorter plays were performed, uh, Elephant, uh, uh, The King of All Times, and uh, another play, The uh, Seller of Molossus, uh, something like that. Uh, and they were both about the intelligence apparatus. Uh, so. Uh, I think he relied on parables, on political projection, uh, uh, more than anything else uh, in his work. And later in his work, or in his mid-career, I would say, before you know, stopping for a long period of time, for a decade, I think Wenus relied on adaptations, uh, uh, whether from Peter Weiss or from Antonio Guerrero Vallejo. Uh, the Rape was from the second Spanish writer, and Hanzala was adapted from Peter Weiss, uh, but then he came back very strongly in his last last phase with the numerous plays. One of them was the one which was performed here or right here, and I think many of them are really masterpieces. Uh, Neda, you study Sufism and uh, work with medieval Sufi texts and also more contemporary uh, texts on Sufism, and clearly strong thread in, in Wanusa's work. So if you could speak to us about how Sufism, and perhaps also how, how his conflicted relationship with nationalism uh, affected his work. Yes, well, thank you, Shami. Um, yes, as you said, Sufism is quite a, a strong uh, undercurrent in this place, Rituals of Signs and Transformations, which um, was read here uh, for a couple of nights. Um, the use of Sufism is um, it's not a peculiar use in modern Arabic literature. Um, it is generally used whether you use Sufi motifs or, or Sufi characters that are interjected in uh, literary works, whether poetic, whether dramatic, whether in novels, um, because uh, um, they entertain a specific vision <coughs> of an alternate existence, which is to a certain extent an ideal existence that is also very uh, linked to the dramatic, to the theatrical, to the poetic. And several of the of specifically Sufi characters, such as uh, Halaj, who martyred himself for, uh, uh, for, for an ideal vision of existence. He was, he was uh, uh, killed by the Abbasid Caliphate at the time. Um, characters such as Ibn al-Arabi, <coughs> Characters such as Rabi al Adawiya, those who dedicate themselves for the ultimate good, remain sources of inspiration in modern literature. 
Now, with respect to this, to, to this uh, uh, work, we have the Sufism works itself on two different levels. On the one hand, we have one character, Abdullah, who turns into a Sufi after a dramatic event in his life. He thinks that his life is meaningless, and as such, uh, turns to his uh, uh, to his roots, which is um, uh, uh, he, he is linked to the Prophet because he is through, through his descent line, but also his father, who is linked to the Prophet, is also linked to him on a spiritual level basis. He he carries his spiritual legacy, so he turns back to his to his, to the original Islamic or spiritual legacy of Islam. That is on the one hand, there is a character who turns into a Sufi character, but on the other hand, the play itself is run through Sufi motifs and Sufi thought that portrays itself even at the moment with the most secular characters. For example, Mu'mina, who becomes a prostitute, is also led by this sort of uh, uh, Sufi themes where in which she lets her inner, real inner existence portray itself to the outside, where she cares where, uh, that, that the outside immoral world does not affect her. And she believes that you know, her, her lower gender status is a result of, of uh, 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 the moral values that are placed on her um, by, by the outside, by outside norms. So she uses you know, inner, outer uh, 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 dichotomy, this sort of illumination, um, in the, uh, with this character and also with other characters. He has used this Sufism not necessarily just as motifs, but as I said, as a, as a unifying factor that, that puts together all characters, no matter how diverse they are, they become a unified self in the sense that they are all trying to reach their, illumin uh, their illuminated selves that are one with, with themselves. Now, Sadala Manus also has, has found, uh, he uses a lot of intertextuality in, in that his texts generally are, 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 are uh, uh, um, a combination of so many, of, of different historical moments, of different uh, um, uh, uh, literary genres that are all put together within the text. And in that respect, he has used, you know, Sufism becomes one of the intertextual tools in which he talks about, you know, uh, uh, concerns of the present moment through uh, either themes or through characters or through uh, uh, modes of thought that existed before. And I think that is one of the uh, one of the riches, with richness of one knows. That is one of the um, aesthetic values that he has as a dramatist in that. He is uh, a, a craftsman in combining so many genres together within his within his work, or so many historical moments where you have at the same moment you have different historical moments playing on stage, or or, or various um, trends of thought that may not seem to be comparable to each other or related to each other come together in such a unified form. And so, yeah, uh, as I said, he is not unique in that, but his use in this respect, with this specifically with this play, is really uh, uh, the underlying tone that, that pulls the whole play together. One of the beautiful things about how Sufism and Arab theater uh, interact and interface, you know, Sufism being a mystical uh, sort of interpretation of Islam and a, and a kind of a mystical experience of, uh, of Muslim belief, Muslim practice, uh, and a celebration of of sensuality as a celebration of aesthetic beauty and of art uh, lends itself so well, in, in, in my opinion, to uh, to theatrical performance and, and just to artistic expression in general. And and it's it's not a coincidence that the enemies of Sufism uh, tend to also be the enemies of art in in, in the Arab world because I think there's a, a direct threat perceived. It's also part of the whole thing in that play play on contrasts with uh, the whole thing about uh, the um, hypocrisy of institutions, whether you're talking about social, political, or in this case, religious. The mufti and the whole hypocrisy of the religious institution of that. So when you uh, uh, talk about Sufism and the spirituality of it, it is contrasted in its purity to the corruption of the institution of the religion. Just like in every other case, uh, there is a contrast between the purity of something and the way it's corrupted in its institution. This is, this is very true, just one yeah. phrase, because uh, Wanus's uh, plays, generally speaking, are like, uh, 
there is a dialectic in them. There is always a contrast. This is very true. Well, this goes to the, your question, I think, about the individual and the, the collective, is that one is, is constantly playing with a series of kind of inherited uh, dialectics, Eastern, Western, uh, high, low, the orthodox, the heterodox. They're constantly the inside, the outside, and theater's a wonderful place to play these out. And one final one news question uh, for, the, for the team. Uh, the term political theater, which I know was referenced, and I wanted to direct this to, to Riyadh, uh, and which Wynous kind of rejected somehow and coined his own term, the theater of politicization. Um, uh, what does that mean to you? What is a theater of politicization as opposed to a political theater? Well, I think that, as I said before, uh, Arab theater, uh, especially after 1967, was political. Whether in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in many places, in Tunisia. So when he <coughs> wanted to go beyond, to be unique, and he uh, inherited that concept, obviously, from Brecht. Uh, he wanted to be, first, educational to the people, secondly, to interact with people, uh, uh, as Sahar has said, and also to uh, transcend the problem of censorship. So that made him focus on politicizing uh, uh, his uh, work in theater rather than presenting political theater, which is true about almost all theater, from Greek tragedy to Shakespeare to uh, uh, modern plays. Uh, he wanted to be unique, and he wanted uh, to be uh, uh, different from many Arab writers, uh, whether in Syria or in Egypt. Whether he succeeded or not in being unique, I can't answer that. But certainly he's a, a brilliant uh, craftsman. He's a very talented playwright. So, uh, as a theater director and as an activist uh, with a strong commitment to, to women's rights, to change, to social change, uh, how are you inspired by Winus's work and also by other works that you you approach as an artist uh, to, to change the society in which you live? Um, well, although I do understand and appreciate Wenus's uh, earlier work that Robert uh, beautifully uh, briefed us on, uh, the earlier work that are highly inspired by Brecht and the interactive aspect of the theater, the political theater, but I'm particularly interested and inspired, highly inspired by his recent, like later work as uh, you know, the recent place that he wrote just before he actually passed away. In the sense that he, he made the shift from the focus on the institutions into the focus on the individual. I'm personally interested in personal stories all the time. I think this is one way to understand the bigger historical picture of any society. And when News did the shift later with the place such as uh, rituals of science and transformations or drunken days, we, you, can t you can see, for instance, how in terms of simple things like character names, in his re earlier work like uh, uh, The King's Elephant, you see man number one, number two, number three, woman one, two, three. It's very Brechtian in the sense, right? It's not the individual, it's the institution behind the individual. Only the protagonist would have names, for instance. But the characters were not as complex. Uh, actors would break out of roles and speak directly to the audiences, all of this. But later you find really layered and complex characters like we saw in Rituals of Science and Transformations. And through the stories of the characters, you get to understand the, big, the bigger picture behind them. Like, and he does say in the introduction actually to Rituals of Science and Transformation that these characters are not representations of the institution they represent, like the sheikh or the mufti or uh, the prostitute, but these are individuals on their own. This is, I, I'm highly interested in, think, in this and I think this this is one way to do, to impact people and to do change. And he does say something I, I came across today in an interview with Marie Lies, uh, a, a theater historian. Uh, just one year before he, he, he passed away, he said, for the first time I feel free in my writing, considering that he stopped thinking about the auditorium, about the people. And he built that kind of uh, you know, fourth wall. It, it, his, his plays became a way different than Brecht, for instance, would have loved. The one, one Brechtian element, one could argue, in rituals is the distancing, if 
fact that he placed the play in 19th century, uh, in 18th century Syria, although he, it was uh, the nucleus of the play was an actual historic incident that happened in. So, but anyway, this this thing just the f building, putting these characters, these individuals on stage, I find a beautiful paradox in here. Just by forgetting about the auditorium, you're actually imposing more impact on them because now they can relate to the complexity of the characters. It's not the incident, it's just and, the and personal. How, how does your art inform your own activism? How does your art inform? I'm personally interested in personal stories, but at the same time, I love, I, highly an advocate of theater that seeks political change. I did lots of um, forum theater based on Auguste Boal. My upcoming project is a play um, that I'm devising with my students on the civil war, for instance. And I'm using what one news would have loved uh, to see probably, which is the human narrative, uh, personal stories, personal narrative that actually suffered during the war. And at the same time, I'm using the interactive approach that is also influenced uh, Bon News at the beginning of his uh, career as a playwright. Um, this is the kind of theater I love to do and I engage myself in. And as actually Riyadh said, all theater is political. I mean, come think about it. <coughs> Whatever we put on stage, if why would we put something that we're very comfortable with and something that we praise and love on stage? You would, you would put on stage things that you want to change or you want to see, you know, uh, yeah, change or alter in a certain direction, so. Um. One thing that was so striking for us when we were in Lebanon this past December was um, a certain inability to talk about a civil war that stretched over 15 years. And, you know, it's sort of bouncing off the walls oh, yeah. everywhere you turn. And uh, Malik made a point of asking almost everyone he met somehow, uh, why was there a civil war? What were the you know what were the reasons, or how would you how would you interpret, define, explain uh, what happened? Uh, and no one could answer that question. They would usually sort of dodge the question or, or somehow somehow avoid it. And it became really clear to us that there is uh, a, a need to 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 look at that very recent history uh, theatrically that there's a need to mine stories that can get people to start talking about that, uh, you know, horrible phenomenon yeah. that really has and not been And these are the kinds of plays that get censored in Lebanon, like plays that, in one way, you know, the fact that we, it's not very um, uh, easy to talk about the civil war is simply because the same people who did the civil war are still leading the country. <laughs> Exactly the same people. So that's and the, the kind of place that and the war continues Jeez. in different forms. So and these are the plays that get censored. Um. Uh, a, uh, a a theater artist who who we met, uh, uh, Lena, um, when we were in Lebanon, shared a story where she had uh, produced a play about the Algerian civil war, and she did so deliberately for a Lebanese audience to draw the parallels because she said the parallels were so obvious in the play and the reaction she got from people was oh my god these Algerians are so brutal they're so, you know, there was a complete sort of disconnect from and, and, a, and a conscious refusal to to make those 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 parallels but also in interfacing with with Lebanese students which was just such a fantastic experience for us to have uh, doing some presentations at both the American University and the Lebanese American University um, we saw this hunger we saw this this real hunger for people to be able to articulate stories and experiences and uh, but but a frustration that there wasn't necessarily a way to tap that where it was it was it was being uh, discouraged uh, Nabil, you had you had mentioned uh, poetry earlier, and, and poetry is sort of the preeminent uh, art form in the Arab world. So I, I'd like to talk about sort of a, a hierarchy of mediums or art forms, and, and, and where theater might fit into that in, in an Arab context. Yeah, I think I mean uh, poetry in a sense is the easiest of forms. In Arab culture, because it goes way back to pre-Islamic times, when uh, the poet was the spokesperson for their tribe, and it was the way of uh, uh, expressing uh, many different forms, uh, whether uh, politics or love or uh, different uh, ideas. Um, 
and it has evolved over uh, the years and up to now uh, different uh, political ideas have been put into poetry. So whether it's classical poetry or modern poetry, take it under the various dictators that have now fallen and some that are in the process of uh, falling, the, uh, uh, none of their ideas uh, mattered at all. Whereas poets who expressed ideas against them their ideas spread like wildfire whenever they wrote something and it went in uh, media uh, from one Arab country to, uh, to others. Um, theater has evolved in various forms, I would say, and is still evolving and has been taken over now in uh, the internet uh, media. And you can see on Facebook different skits, particularly comic ones, trying to um, make fun of various uh, leaders who are still in power. So it is taking various forms. And Lebanon is one country where theater has, is quite old, from the 60s until now. The Lebanese have been able to express themselves in theatrical forms. And it's interesting to go through the history of that. But in other Arab countries, the theater has been more easily suppressed. So you can do a comparative analysis and see um, how it is beginning to emerge in different places. And through the evolution of Lebanese theater, see what el what's happening in Arab countries, because Lebanese theater expresses the concerns uh, of other Arabs in other Arab uh, countries. But uh, in terms of uh, poetry, if you take uh, now, I mean, the, the, the great poets, even the uh, contemporary ones, they uh, have mostly recently died, so we don't have many that are still uh, alive. Uh, Nizar Qabbani and Mahmoud Darwish, the most recent ones, have uh, passed on. And they have expressed some beautiful uh, sentiments. Uh, Nizar, in particular, was able to break uh, sexual taboos, social taboos, as well as uh, political uh, taboos. And um, in terms of the Arab uprising, if you 10, 15 years ago, he wrote a poem about children with stones, Atfal al-Hijara. And that poem spread like wildfire throughout the Arab world. And his poem predicts, in a way, he addresses himself directly to Arab dictators. And he uh, shames them through all the different things they have done to their own people. And the things they have not been able to do for their people. And in the end, he says, you will be replaced by children with stones. Children, children with stones will challenge you they will replace you. And he was prescient in that in the end, uh, it was peaceful protesters mostly who were able to very quickly overthrow uh, dictators. And in the cases where dictators used their military against peaceful protesters, then we uh, saw civil wars uh, and so on. Uh, but um, poems uh, like uh, Nizar Kabbani's uh, poems were very uh, motivating in that people repeated them and they helped break the wall of fear. Um, Nizar was very eloquent and many of his poems were put to song by very famous uh, singers. And so they uh, got replayed and, and uh, that is more than just uh, reading a poem which some might read and some might not read, but when a famous singer picks up that poem and sings it, then everybody, whether even the illiterate, you know, then uh, start uh, repeating those it, words. It's, it's, it gets a lot of replay. Yeah. It's always been, thank you, it's always been really amazing for me to see the status of poets. You know, in this country, if you're a poet, you probably starve. Um, but in, in, the, in the Arab world, the poet is such a revered, figure and you know people will quote poets with with great ease and, and frequency and, and poets become sort of the arbiters of a lot of political discourse and just you know um, 
uh, social understanding and understanding of self and, and identity. I, I want to um, jump to the issue of censorship because we, we've mentioned censorship a few times. The, um, and some experiences that we've personally had with uh, what I call Silk Road governments or <laughs> governments of Silk Road countries um, uh, attempting to, to somehow censor us here in you know the basement of the First United Methodist Church, uh, and and most uh, most notably with the uh, something that happened a few years ago, uh, where the, well actually more than that was uh, I think this was 2006, the summer of the Silk Road that the city of Chicago organized, and we were participating in that with the uh, what was then the Department of Cultural Affairs and the Chicago Cultural Center, presenting a series of readings, and one of our readings was a play by a Chinese-American playwright uh, called Ching Chong Chinaman. Uh, and it was very much a parody and riff on all you know these kind of um, uh, racist ideas about Chinese-Americans. And, uh, and I think a fantastic play. The, the, the Chinese government was a partner to the city in the organizing of the summer. And so they passed along to our contact at the city some notes for us. And, and, and one of the notes, <laughs> One of the notes was very much a directive that, you know, tell Silk Road they have to change the title of the play. Um, and it was very matter of fact, and I was quite fascinated by that, that they, they did not see any sort of conflict in giving us that, that directive, that <laughs> order. Um, at which time, we said to our contact at the city that, uh, you know, the, the day the Chinese government tells us how to program this theater is the day we shut it down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, conversely, uh, Yusuf El Gindi, who's an Egyptian American playwright, uh, has had numerous problems in Egypt with his work because he's constantly his scripts are returned to him with all these lines, sort of redacted, and uh, all these instructions about what he has to change and what character has to be. And you know, to this day, he has not been produced in Egypt. Uh, although there, you know, certainly, certainly has has had offers. Uh, because he refuses to adhere uh, to this uh, this form of censorship, so I, I'd like us to, to speak a bit about uh, how that that plays itself out in the context of producing theater and 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 programming a theater and selecting um, work to you know to put in front of audiences. I can perhaps share with you our story with rituals uh, because we produced this play in Beirut, as Shamil said last December, and in Lebanon we still practice self-censorship, uh, sorry, uh, prayer censorship, where you have to send your text to the censor, to the general security, before you can put it on stage. And you cannot actually put it on stage without having every page of your text stamped, as if approved, and a letter from the general security allowing you to present the play. Now, usually, theater artists in the country we know by now what kind of things get censored. So we do a kind of self-censorship before we send the text. What we did in rituals is that we took out the word mufti, because mufti is a red line for the general security. The mufti is the highest uh, religious uh, jurist in Islam. And you are not allowed by any way, shape, or form to mention even a mufti, say a mufti in a place. So what we did, we took out that, and then we took out also all the stage directions that has to do with the gay uh, scene in the play where the gay couple are uh, cuddling and hugging and all of this, because this is another taboo subject. We're not uh, supposed to speak about sexuality in general. Rest aside, uh, homosexuality. So we took out this and we sent the text, and we, in a matter of two, three weeks, we got the approval with every page stamped. Now, one, my assumption is that because it's also in English, they don't really read the censor people. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's in English, they definitely don't read. What they do is like they skim and they have like words, like keywords, where they would stop and say, okay, this is, we need to read around this. At one point, I was directing Noises Off by Michael Fryne, and the director goes in the play, he has a line where he goes, I am God. That line got censored. You're not, look, atheism, right? It's, you cannot do that on stage. So theater, I, I find it flattering, to be honest, that they're scared of theater. It gives me hope that theater is still as powerful as what I think of it. Um, and it, to think of it also in a positive way, it allows theater artists to be uh, way more creative. Um, 
you find ways to, to do whatever you want. I did a play, an adaptation of an American play that is a romantic uh, sexual comedy, and of course we got censored. Uh, they actually give you suggestions sometimes. <laughs> they are very generous. <laughs> they help you write the play, so they uh, delete some words and they give you other options. Most of the time, we don't comply, but if they happen to be in the auditorium, they can um, you know, shut it down, shut the show down. Um, you, you see, like they sh recently they uh, censored a play that has that talks about censor. Um, it was by a, a colleague of mine, Lucien Borgeli. He did an interactive forum piece on censorship. A group of people. Uh, the play talks about a group of people writing. A, actually, a film director submitting his film to censor and uh, how the censor people dealt with him. And uh, they went on TV actually to speak about why they censored the play. And what they said is that it's not even artistically interesting. <laughs> so this is, this is the kind of censor. It's definitely a challenge. But on the other hand, it allows for more creativity because it's not going to stop us, really. It, I, I've always thought that it is not a coincidence that some of the greatest cinema in the world is coming out of Iran. <laughs> and it, it has to do yeah. with this issue of censorship mm -hmm. and, and navigating. Uh, interestingly, the final performance in Beirut of Rituals, uh, the actors very bravely and boldly decided to name the character the Mufti. True. And um, uh, Sahar's note to them was that if we are fined, you are paying the fine. Well, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you something, quick comment on the evolution of censorship in Lebanon. In the 1960s, and I'm old enough to remember an incident where uh, Nidal Lashar and her Be original Beirut theater uh, did a play in which they compare uh, Lebanon to a brothel uh, with a lot of Westerners controlling the country. And the scene begins with what looks like in a dark uh, brothel lovemaking going on. Uh, barely 10 minutes into that scene, uh, the the uh, gendarme enter into the theater and close it down. Two days later, they go to the horseshoe on Hamra Street, a popular uh, sidewalk cafe, and they start performing it there. They get away with one performance. The next day, they come back to do it again, and they're onto them, so they close it down. So fast forward to a few, uh, couple of years ago. The government isn't so vigilant anymore. But they have something on where now uh, a, a TV show that uh, puppets make fun of all the different popular leaders. You can now make fun of the president of the republic, no problem. But they try to depict Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the followers of Hezbollah descend on the TV station and nearly burn it down. So the TV station promises never to depict uh, Nasrallah anymore. <laughs> so you got rid of government uh, censorship, but now the parties uh, follow their own interests and uh, prevent uh, that from happening. There you go. Neda, did you want an interesting story about uh, the, the play we presented this past weekend uh, being performed in Aleppo, in northern Syria? Uh, yes, but uh, regarding censorship as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that was one of the uh, one of the very common questions that we were asked, you know, during these uh, these uh, the two three nights that we uh, we played. Um, I was con constantly asked, um, did the play uh, uh, per was it performed in Syria? And of course, I said yes, it was performed, and it was not censored. The mufti showed, you know, as a mufti in the play he was called a mufti in Damascus. However, uh, uh, the play was on a tour and it was supposed to play in Aleppo. Uh, the Mufti in Aleppo heard about the play and someone had gone to him and told him what the content of it was. And of course, he issued a religious decree that it was supposed to be banned. Uh, and, and it was. And it was banned. And it was banned. There's a scene in the play in which the Mufti gives a religious decree. So yeah. this is one reason people yeah. found it very ironic. If you Saw the play. <laughs> <laughs> well, was even during his lifetime, it played for the first time in Beirut, this play. And even when he was alive, he knew that the, the character of the Mufti had to be uh, uh, shifted. And uh, he did accept that. I mean, uh, even when he was alive, the Mufti was not called Mufti, whatever. He was called Sheikh Qasim, without reference to his... Uh, uh, or there was an allusion to his, to re uh, that refers to his post, but not necessarily called 
I, I also want to add there's uh, some very overt uh, gay content in this play. And when we were sitting in the, in the audience in, in Beirut for the opening night, I was quite nervous. Like, how, how is this content going to be uh, received? And you, you literally could not hear a pin drop in the theater during those scenes. And, and I thought that was really very encouraging. And I, I noticed so many people leaning forward and like, you know, trying to grab onto. So something was going on in, in the room. Uh, that I was, uh, I was very impressed because I, we, you know, I just had no idea. It's not subtle. I mean, it's actually, it's quite, it's quite overt in a way that I would not associate with, uh, with the Arab theater. And uh, so, I think there's some very encouraging signs in that. And you know, we have two playwrights uh, on on the panel, and I'm, I, uh, Riyad and Robert, and uh, Syrian playwrights and an American playwright. And I'm, I'm curious to hear. Uh, from Riyadh, how, how you have been influenced by uh, American theater, and from Robert, uh, how you have been influenced by the Arab theater. Robert, do you start or shall I start? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, well, um, also I teach theater, and uh, <coughs> it allows me um, to put uh, uh, to put these things into context. That's why I love that you've told the story of, of the censorship here at Silk Road. When, when I teach uh, British theater, um, I point out that you know there was prior censorship in, in Great Britain until the mid-60s. Any play with gay content in Great Britain before 1960 was thrown in the trash or returned, and the notes are there from the censor to read, you know, there were, you know, uh, really uh, outrageous sorts of coming, I mean, fairy trash or whatever in, in Smith. So it's very important, I think, that, that people have an understanding in historical terms. Um, one of the theater artists whom I admire the most in uh, Lebanon is Ravia Marue, who, um, in addition to being a sort of classically trained uh, actor, uh, also does performance art. And one of his tactics for plays um, uh, to uh, avoid censorship is simply to announce informally to people that he's doing uh, a performance. And they're very interesting performances that, again, might, you know, uh, they're very allegorical, as Suryad was talking about. People have very highly evolved allegorical language, for instance. One has to do with, uh, you know, three characters on a couch and two of them keep knocking the other one off the couch. And those of you who sort of, you know, Lebanon's a tiny little country and it's got all these little groups and everybody's just kind of like knocking each other, whatever. And the dialogue as such um, frequently in his plays um, <coughs> does not uh, allude in a direct way to what's going on on the stage. There's a lot of very fascinating point, counterpoint, juxtaposition. Um, uh, critiques of performance art in uh, Europe and uh, appropriating it uh, in a tradition in which the Hakawati, as we were talking about before, the storyteller, or whatever, is this really key, you know, figure. The poet, you know, is this seer. So this idea that you have this rarefied kind of art form from the West, you know, performance art, Karen Finley et al., Rabia's wonderful, and Lena Sane, his partner, are wonderful at doing these send-ups. Um, uh, uh, we had the good fortune of working with Shawab al-Assadi, uh, uh, who is from Iraq, who did direct the first uh, production of Wanis's uh, uh, Mamluk Jabbar, the adventure of Mamluk Jabbar's uh, head, who was um, uh, Wanis's protege in Damascus. He's Iraqi. Uh, his brother was uh, executed by Saddam. Uh, Jawad was studying in Bulgaria. He um, never returned, uh, and he ended up in uh, Syria, which ironically, when I tried to bring him to the States, was a big problem because he had a Syrian passport. It was one of, and I went, well, you know, he's, he's a, 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 an opponent of uh, Saddam, and uh, that's why he has a Syrian passport. The, the, the Iraqi government uh, took it away. We, we did a play by him called uh, Baghdadi Bath, um, uh, Haram, uh, Hamam Baghdadi, which I saw a couple of times in, uh, in Damascus and in Lebanon. And then um, it 
traveled to the U.S. It was done at Dartmouth with uh, Asif Mandi, who you may know as the reporter on The Daily Show, is a wonderful uh, actor, and Sean Krishnan, who is in Homebody Couple by uh, Tony Kushner. Um, they did it at Dartmouth as a stage reading, but I must say it was really, really well received. And then it was done uh, off-Broadway. By far, the most um, fruitful experience I've had is to work with the uh, with the uh, Saha, uh, Asaf is sitting over here, and I say this not because she's sitting over here and because I love her, but <laughs> because I've literally been working in the theater for three decades, and I've had the good fortune to work with a lot of really wonderful uh, directors, Gary Griffin and uh, Jonathan Wilson from here in Chicago, George, the late George Firth, uh, Evan Yanoulis, who's at uh, Yale uh, Drama School, some really, really very sharp, wonderful directors, and um, uh, saw her maybe in part because she's an actor, um, in part because this material was so um, significant for her, um, and in part because Nanda and I had taken this process, process from the very beginning, which is to say we started with an Arabic text, we were looking at a French version as we went along, um, we had no conception when we began this project that it would uh, ever go to a, a production, uh, and certainly not as quickly as it did. This wonderful synergy, critical mass occurred with the MacArthur Foundation and, and Silk Road. And so uh, there was an urgency to the project when uh, we were working on it in Beirut. So I directed it, uh, I produced it, worked as a dramaturg, we had professional actors working alongside some of our students, and the response was overwhelmingly positive, and um, it, we felt like theater mattered in a way that I have not seen in the decade I've uh, been there. This is a play that really, for whatever reason, profoundly uh, touched people, and I'm so excited that now uh, more and more people are beginning to know about one news. Well. I think my experience was basically influenced by Shakespeare, especially because I adapted some plays from the Arabian Nights. Uh, but also, of course, uh, there are other influences from Lorca, the Spanish, from Peter Weiss, uh, from Brecht, uh, from several authors. But referring to the American theater, actually, there were some influences as well. Elmer Rice is one. Eugene O'Neill is another figure who influenced me, I wrote uh, actually a play entitled Morning Becomes Antigone, <laughs> <laughs> which is about uh, a country devastated by a civil war, uh, without naming the country, but uh, that play was banned actually from professional production, and it was only published in Beirut uh, uh, at that time. Strangely enough, it was allowed to be uh, in the bookshops in Damascus. But it was banned from being published in Damascus or from professionally at that time uh, because uh, of the nuances of the civil war in uh, Lebanon. Also, I was influenced partly by Arthur Miller, whom I met later on at a conference in Salzburg, uh, uh, Austria. And uh, uh, I uh, told Arthur, late Arthur that I wanted very much to direct the crucible. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I, I quit directing for theater be before I fulfilled my dream. The other great playwright uh, I was close to as a director, not as a playwright, is the great Tennessee Williams. I directed in Damascus, adapted and directed two of his greatest plays, A Streetcar Named Desire, and I based it in Damascus rather than in New Orleans. And I also directed uh, for the Academy uh, of Dramatic Arts before I became its director. I directed The Glass Menagerie. And uh, I really thought that uh, those uh, plays appealed to me, at least. And I hope they appeal to the audience. Uh, a street uh, car named Desire, in particular, because it played in a proscenium, big theater, with an intake of 500 people. Uh, it played mostly to a packed house. So uh, uh, it was sort of daring and controversial production to base it in Damascus in the 50s. Uh, that's all I think.
A lot has been said and written about uh, sexism in the American theater and limited opportunities for women directors and playwrights and actors. Uh, I think there's this, uh, I think it's the statistic is like 17% of, of plays in a given year will be plays written by women that get produced in American theaters. Um, although theater critic Chris Jones tells us that this year in Chicago may actually be an exception to that rule. Uh, where there are so many plays being produced consecutively uh, by, by women playwrights. I, I want to talk about um, uh, sexism in the Arab theater and uh, uh, constraints or limitations or obstacles that women theater makers face uh, in, in the Arab world. Sahar. My personal experience is that, well, I'm not directly involved in, in theatrical productions or in acting. I'm an I'm academic and my work on theater is basically study of the theatrical texts and translation of, of, of dramatic works. So I would say, you know, it, my work has not been hindered at all, you know, with, with gendered uh, 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 stereotypes or, or uh, restrictions or whatever. I think Sahar would be better able to, to, uh, to address that from her perspective. I would like to add that at this, at this point, uh, there are very influential women actresses and directors in Lebanon, at least. Nidal al Ashar, Lina Abiyad. Sometimes they are more on, you know, in the dramatic scene than men, and they are quite productive and they are quite influential. And uh, and uh, their works uh, uh, travel. Like Lina is always traveling. She had a work not so long ago in New York. Um, Nidal al Ashar is a widely known name in, in the Arab theatrical scene, and you know her work in, in Al Madina theater is uh, is quite uh, impressive. So I would say yes, women have been quite challenging and and, and breaking the, the uh, you know the uh, uh, the boundaries, the barriers that uh, that restrict them, and and they are quite vocal uh, in that respect. Many of them, such as Lina Abia, for example, she's an academician just as much as she is a as a, as a director, and, and she is quite influential even in bringing about new um, new generations, new actors in in her uh, 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 you know work with students and whatnot. So I would say yes, there are always you know these these stigmas that that face us, but they face us not necessarily only as women, but also as people who work in this field which is always problematic because you know when you have a, a, a show on stage there is a direct a relation with the audience it's not that you are reading it in your in the comfort of your home and as such it's more threatening as such so uh, uh, these are the problematics that probably face face us in theater in, in drama more than uh, uh, that it is specifically directed against us as women or not I, I mean, I support what Nada is saying. I think, interestingly enough, we have more women working in the theater in Lebanon than men. I took a, I did a study in around 2005 on women directors in Lebanon, and I went around interviewing uh, women directors. Some like uh, Latifa Multa, for instance, or Nidal Ashar, who are pioneers directors in Lebanon, or Lina Abyad, who is the most prolific theater director. In the last couple of years, she directed more than 15 plays in school and outside school. And none of the male directors have ever done that. So in that sense, I don't think the, there is a, that challenge in a way. Maybe it's the other way around. Whenever we're casting a play, it's harder to find male actors than finding female actors. And I think some people think this is not a, one, because it's not, you can't make a living. So it's not a job. Uh, and it's a little bit, um, you know, uh, uh, males wouldn't be interested in taking this as a job. Um, and on the other hand, I think we ought to highlight the feminist theater that is that is taking place. I mean, especially in the last years, one news is one way. Uh, this is a, because we're talking about one news here, and I think it's important to just mention that his last plays are highly feminist. Like the 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 kind of act that his female protagonist did in the plays is very much comparable to uh, the, the female protagonist of Ibsen, for instance, in Doll's House. Like, they slammed the door and they left, and their action is much more riskier than Ibsen's woman, for instance, because Nora was 
wouldn't be like her life is not threatened by slamming the door on her husband, but Almasa by becoming a prostitute, it's a definitely an it's legal to shed her blood. It's totally acceptable to shed her blood. Same thing in drunken days, for instance, the mother who leaves her husband for a Christian lover. Same thing. Um, you see Ibsen being produced, and mainly it's by female, I would say, directors and actors. Uh, last year, the Norwegian embassy in Lebanon, they sponsored um, uh, like uh, Ibsen's festival, I think it was called, or something, and they, um, they commissioned uh, female directors like Lina Abyad or Aida Sabra to produce plays by Ibsen, but at the same time some companies did that. And you see female, like the pioneer, for instance, of drama therapy in Lebanon is there also a female, Zena Dakash, who, whose work in the female pri in the, in the prison, um, women prison, excuse me, uh, is highly feminist. Of course, the play is about, you know, she, it takes a drama therapy approach to shed light on the uh, dire circumstances that these prisoners are facing, but it's highly feminist in the sense that it's a, it's a very strong critique to the patriarchal system that leads to all these crimes uh, that these women commit. So um, I, think, I think we're very active, to be honest, and I don't think we're chatting that much. That's so much, much. my impression. <laughs> Um, I have a bunch of other questions, but I think I'm going like, to jump over them and, and open this up to uh, the audience. We can always come back to. I just want to say one thing that uh, very quickly, there's something called uh, the literature of prisons, Adab Sujun, which deserves a whole, uh, it, it's a lacuna, it's something in Arab literature, there isn't enough on it. And in the theater in particular, there's very little on it. Uh, Morocco, there's a lost generation. People who spent 20 years disappeared, tortured, etc., came out of that uh, era. And there are only three books that some of these people wrote on that. And this is something that deserves a lot of attention. That's, that's all I want to say. Thank you. And one, one thing I should probably also point out is I'm, I'm so aware of our Egyptian friends uh, sitting in the house tonight. And of course, Egypt is the, uh, the other great nexus of, of Arab theater. We have a very Levantine bias up here on, on the panel, uh, a, a very Syro Lebanese. Uh, when, we, when we talk of the Arab world, we're of course talking about a, a vast geography. Um, so I just want to put out there that we are, we are speaking through a, a particular prism, but a, a prism that nevertheless uh, has been enormously influential uh, beyond the Levant. Uh, well, it's important world. to say actually that Egypt was the country that welcomed all the uh, theater makers when they had to flee censorship and other oppression in Lebanon and Syria, uh, the time of George Abyad and uh, and Wanus, you know, very early on in his career, you know, was was in Cairo. He was, you know, a huge fan of Nasser, but he also is highly influ influenced by uh, Taufik Al Hakim, uh, Alfred uh, Farage. So, um, you know, the idea that it you can pick a point and say, oh, it starts there. This is the beauty of the intertextuality that Nabda is talking about. It's this wonderful, very complex web. The wonderful thing about literature and theater crosses borders. I want to add that uh, also in Damascus, uh, uh, the premieres of uh, some plays by uh, Mahmoud Diab or Alfred Farage, mm -hmm. you know, they were in Damascus, especially Mahmoud Diab. Mahmoud Diab. I myself directed one of uh, Alfred Farage's plays, but in Cardiff, Wales, not in Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, they were so popular. Uh, Syria. Yeah, and Alfred Farag actually uh, the last the last book is a beautiful feminist text. Beautiful. So big shout out to Egyptian theater. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Yolanda. I have studied. Uh, well, I followed a lot of theater. Um, particularly out of Lebanon and Iran, but through the strength of social media and internet. And as a result of that, there have been a couple of playwrights um, whose work is, is part of the Chicago theater scene this, this year. Um, I wonder if you could speak to uh, specifically Robbie Moroy, 
and Lina Sene and uh, how social media and internet is allowing much more of the theater to really get out and actually join the international dialogue uh, despite the conventions of, the, of traditional theater as it's staged um, in theater houses, it seems to be freeing and able to get out thanks to the internet. Well, I do know in their case that they're not in Lebanon very much anymore. They are sort of on permanent tour, um, which is wonderful. Uh, I spoke about uh, the two of them at uh, Yale's World Performance Project, which Joe Roach runs in about 2006. And um, just then they were beginning to, people were beginning to discover um, uh, their work, and uh, now you know they're performing in India and Japan, and you know uh, they're in North America. You know, constantly, every once in a while, I'll see one of them in in Beirut. But as far as I know, they're they're pretty much touring their work around the world. And this is, uh, I think, one of the most extraordinary things about media in general. But uh, also, uh, a figure like Juan is that we began to see uh, his work and the work of these more uh, contemporary theater artists as world theater. That it's no longer, uh, you know, a circumscribed by, you know, sort of a State Department delineation or whatever. These are like very important theater artists that happen to be from Egypt or happen to be from Syria or whatever. And, and you know, uh, uh, Riyadh is the embodiment of this kind of cosmopolitanism that I encountered, for example, in Latin America in the 70s when I was horribly embarrassed arriving not speaking Spanish or Portuguese and, and uh, uh, meeting people who had, you know, read, you know, Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams and uh, Faulkner and Hemingway and French literature and, and it informed their work. So that was in an earlier era. Now I think people who want to be aware of what's going on in theater have the ability through YouTube, through uh, social media, to be able to see work from all over the world. And uh, now, as it were, they're speaking back. They're informing, you know, German performance artists and, and Japanese uh, performers. So. Um, you know, more specifically about the social media, I don't know, but I do know that they're quite influential and quite in, in demand. Yes. Um, thank you for the discussion. It was very interesting. In just over an hour, you co covered so many subjects. My question to R uh, Riyadh, or but not only, regarding censorship, when you were talking about that earlier, um, my question about the relationship between uh, one news and Hafez Assad. The late president, uh, if you can tell us about, because of course, Wanus was very critical of Assad very openly, and and Assad was kind of respecting the the artist and um, uh, pushing him to be heard outside of Syria while making sure inside Syria his work would not uh, provoke any kind of reaction from the population. So, if you can tell us about this, or if you if you know anything about it, please. Thank you. I really don't know much about that, but uh, well, the thing is that the first time I ever met Wanus face to face was in 1969. Uh, he uh, finished his study of journalism in Cairo, as Robert uh, mentioned, and he came back from Paris, and uh, he was in the center of light. Uh, his breakthrough and evening's entertainment for the 5th of June was heralded in Beirut and it was published in Mawaqif magazine by Adonis. Uh, and the first two plays which I referred to were produced. Uh, we became close for a period of time. Then there were the ups and downs between any playwright and critic, you know. Uh, he was very sensitive to criticism, uh, which happened later on. But at that time, because I defended him, uh, those uh, two productions, we were very close. I don't know about you know the relationship uh, exactly you are referring to at all, but I know that An Evening's Entertainment was released in Damascus by a very professional cast uh, in 1971. 
and it, it played in Damascus uh, Theater Festival, Arab Theater Festival, which is uh, the father of all festivals. Uh, you know, after that, many festivals were born in different parts of the Arab uh, world. Uh, so, uh, in in both productions, uh, the way I defended him as a critic and it appealed to him, uh, I played on the term revolution within revolution. You know, uh, that was a popular concept from Franz Bannon and Roger Debray uh, at that time, and uh, it gave, you know, the such daring plays some legitimacy, you know, to be performed and produced. And it worked very well. Uh, 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 actually, I was invited uh, on several occasions to talk about Wanus's play at university and so on. Uh, I have an anecdote about that, but probably <laughs> later. <laughs> I think it's important to point out that uh, Syria was very much, arguably is very much, but you know was very much in the within the Soviet orbit and was uh, closely aligned with the Soviet bloc. Uh, and what would often happen, my understanding, uh, is Wanusa's plays would be sent to what were called friendly socialist countries: um, East Germany, Romania, Czechoslovakia at the time, uh, Ukraine, Russia. Uh, as, as sort of evidence of the liberalism of, of the regime, uh, but not necessarily allowed to perform at home. So it was an interesting dance. That is how it has been described to me, although I'm not speaking as an absolute authority on, on the but, but honestly, you know, to, to be fair, uh, Wanusa's plays played in Damascus in that era. I mean, Alfilia Melik is a man elephant, uh, king of all times. The uh, seller of molasses, uh, an evening's entertainment, the adventure of slave Jabber's head, that actually started the deterioration of our relationship because I praised the play and I did not praise his directing of it. <laughs> uh, and then the king is the king, he played by the National Theater, I mean, big productions. Uh, 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 then, of course, Hanzala. Played, uh, directed by the, the very talented, uh, my good late friend Fawaz Sajir, and uh, other plays. Uh, uh, so I think the rape was, uh, uh, I wasn't in Syria at that time, I think I was in Britain. Uh, I think it was banned, I think. I'm yes, not, I'm I not believe, sure, but I believe it I was. I think banned. I was away, but I think it had some problems. It well, he told, he told the New York Times it did, and uh, from what I could find, it. Uh, didn't run there, but um, you know, uh, it. Uh, uh, there is a, a thesis study which I found interesting by I think Al Anesi uh, 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 at a British university, in which he, you know, he proposes that this was in fact one tactic that was employed was to celebrate him abroad. This, you know, is an Eastern Bloc uh, tactic, but I think. It's a key point. It's wonderful to have, you know, uh, someone who is there, you know, so integrally involved saying, yes, you know, these these were presented. Uh, it's a fascinating sort of, of uh, statement on what culture is, you know. Up to a certain point, culture is, is desirable, you know, and, you know, especially it kind of becomes more liberal and certain things are allowed or what's allowed or this is seen to be an allegory of this regime or the next regime because as I understand uh, Mamluk Jabir was was banned for a time but uh, evening no. party they were allowed then to... No, Jabir was not banned uh, honestly. It, uh, it was directed first by Wanus and later on it was revived uh, as a graduation piece for the academy by Jawad Lassen. No, it wasn't banned at all at all. And the king is the king was the band. Uh, I don't think really, uh, to be honest, any of Vernus's plays after an evening's uh, entertainment was banned at all. And the only play which wasn't produced, and that wasn't for a political censorship, is Mirage Epic, which is one of my favorite plays. I love that play, and I really wanted it very much to be produced years back, uh, but uh, unfortunately it wasn't, uh, I don't know, I mean, the chemistry did not work uh, and uh, it 
it wasn't produced ever in Syria. I think probably this is the only one uh, which was not performed on Syrian stages. The rituals was performed but not produced in Syria, but it was hosted with some problems, obviously, as mentioned in Aleppo in particular, as Nada brought up. And thank you for that. Um, thank you very much for being here today um, and for all the different viewpoints. Um, my question ties in a bit to Dr. Nabil Khoury's um, statement about the, uh, the uh, theater of the prison. Um, when Goebbels was talking to his biographer, he said wars are easier, easy to start in any type of um, political system. You go after the intellectuals and, and the people who espouse peace. When you were, my question is, since we've, there's a bit of a lost generation in various Arab countries, does that possibly engender more violence in a, in a subsequent generation because people are not allowed really to express themselves in a literary way or an allegorical way about what has just happened to them? I'm not sure if um, it said they're not allowed or um, that they self-censor. The ones who spend five and 10 and 15 years in prison, uh, particularly the women, that they uh, come out and some of them, their own families don't know what happened to them. Um, that they then try, those who have literary talents, try to suppress what happened. Only very few who are really brave. Um, the ones that I'm familiar with, two of the three cases are women uh, in Morocco. And I think uh, for some of these stories are known. And um, what I think should happen is that friends of people who went through these experiences should adapt these stories and write them. So I was just uh, uh, saying to Riyadh, you know, only half tongue in cheek that the Lebanese and Syrians, you know, the Levantines are prolific writers. That's why their cases are much more widely known. Well, maybe some Levantines who have Moroccan friends and Egyptian friends and so on should take those stories and put them uh, in plays and put them in, in novels. Because these stories need to be known. Um, and, and right now, I mean, we have real life dramas happening in Syria. And I wonder, you know, a lot of these stories come out in actual, on the internet and Facebook and so on. But uh, the real tragedies need to be uh, dramatized in theater, in plays, in novels. And that require, that's, that, that takes time, and that takes talent. Otherwise, uh, people don't really, you need to live these experiences to know what really happened. And I was stationed as a foreign service officer in Morocco twice, and I still have a lot of Moroccan friends. And it's only because of that, and because I, I had friends who spent time in jail and I read uh, and listened to these stories that I know about them. But I think that uh, a lot of these stories are missing, a lot of these people are missing, and, and that's why these stories probably, some people think, are beginning to happen again in Morocco. Although a lot of people think, you know, that Morocco is a, is a positive story and things are very, very, uh, people are doing well, the political system is doing well. I'm not so sure. So I think the stories need to be told, and the theater uh, is an important place for these stories to be told. Uh, Brian and then. Uh, uh, first, uh, kudos to uh, Professor Saad and Professor Myers for the translation. Um, I mean, I'm incapable of reading the Arabic, so I don't know how accurate it was. But it, I, mean, it read, I mean, it sounds very much like good English. A lot of translations are clunky. And this one read very well. 
my question is, like, what did we lose in the translation? Were there dialects that the people spoke that you could understand in Arabic, but we didn't get because it sounded all like the same English? Or was there anything lost? Actually, there wasn't much that was lost. The play itself was written in Fusha Arabic, but not in colloquial. And Sadallah al Musa was very adamant on writing in Fusha. Actually, he first wrote his plays in colloquial, and then he transformed them to Fusha. And he was very adamant that, you know, the Fusha is a theatrical agent, a theatrical tool. He would not at all put a, put a play in colloquial. So in that respect, the language itself, you know, there is a, as, as, as you might know, there is a dichotomy between colloquial Arabic or the, uh, the uh, and, and Fusha, which is the classical form of Arabic. It's, it's the high level Arabic, you know, literary. Um, we tried as much as possible not to have uh, I mean, of course, our first concern was to have this play translated in a form where it can live on stage. It needs to have the aesthetic elements that are there in the Arabic, they need to be transformed in the English form. So yes, there were some, some things that we could not really translate into English because they, they would sound clunky, as you say. Um, but we did translate the spirit of the thing. Like, for example, uh, uh, the statement, did I let the cat out of the bag? Well, it's not in the Arabic text. But <laughs> in the Arabic, there is another you know, uh, 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 statement which mimics that. So we, op of course, we opted to have, did I let the cat out of the bag? Because it, it, it resonates to an English ear rather than to an Arab ear. Um, uh, I would say that there wasn't much that there wasn't much in, as in every translation you lose a little and you gain a little. And but but in terms of content, actually many of those who who saw the play in Lebanon and uh, who actually uh, uh, not only read the play in Beirut but worked with San when it was produced in Beirut said that they could not feel the difference between the Arabic and the English and they commented on the fact that it, it really flowed and it was pretty much. Uh, uh, loyal to, to the Arabic text. So, um, I, yeah, I can tell you, I'm bilingual, and I watched it in English, and it flowed beautifully. And I could sense, I mean, the jokes that how they would be in Arabic versus how they came off in English. So I, I commend uh, the translation. It was excellent. Um, I want to thank all of you for your talking on the subject that I was pretty eager about before I walked in. So anything. I've learned a lot since I knew nothing. Um, I'd like uh, any of the panelists to address uh, whether or not uh, many playwrights are focusing on bringing together more than one ethnic group. In other words, what is being done, what playwrights are addressing the issue of needing to, to bring together some harmony within a particular country of more than one religious or ethnic group. Well, Sakhar pointed to uh, one one of Manus's play, uh, plays, Drunken Days, which does address um, this question of uh, uh, a, a woman who's a, a Muslim woman who ends up um, leading her family for a Christian man, um, which is not simply a taboo, it's like absolutely forbidden. Um, uh, he has a larger project, it seems, of transformation. And transformation, I think, is a recognition of multiple identities. Um, to me, the place spoke somewhat, uh, may be seen as a sort of supplement to Doll's House. What does Nora do when she leaves? It's like, you know, because this is the, the play where she leaves the family pretty quickly and she leaves children, too. I know I teach Doll's House. Um, to students in the Arab world, and they have a terrible time, you know, accepting that. Well, what about the children, which in fact was one of the things that Ibsen came up against actresses who refused to, to do that. If you add this other layer of identity, um, it becomes an even more uh, vexing question. My own experience, very limited as it is, is that people tend to uh, address these questions in very indirect ways. And it could be that censorship, but it could also be that if you try to approach them directly, people will, you know, they'll sort of uh, 
deny or uh, they reject it, whereas if you can find an allegorical language, if you can find a dramatic language, that that in general is the mode. But the problem is, you know, again, as Sahar was saying about uh, the Algerian Civil War uh, uh, material that uh, our colleague Lena Abiyat did, then, you know, you discover that denial is not just a river in Egypt. People are really going, oh, oh Algeria, right? You know, so um, I don't know, maybe others know of a particular place that address these issues of conflict among identities. But I, I, I think now if Rabia and Rui's performance was uh, how Nancy wished that it was all in her school, which actually um, a, a fictional story on the Lebanese Civil War that has four, uh, fight, four uh, fighters that come from different parties, meaning different also uh, religious groups. But all the plays, to be honest, that are jumping to my head now, like Mamdo had one, for instance, The Mask, or um, or news plays, or Ahmed Farag, or Tafik Hakim, there isn't really a mention of, it's not, you know, the, the religious background of the characters is not important to the story in a way. But it's a, it's a very interesting thought you have. Actually, Robert has an idea of a play that he's planning to write. <laughs> that, that's exactly this. But, uh, I, I, I want really to uh, uh, comment on uh, what Sahar said, uh, referring to Mamdou Adwan. Uh, I directed the mosque, but uh, actually the, the two plays that uh, serve the purpose uh, mentioned uh, are two epic plays. The late Mandu Hadwan uh, wrote Safar Berlik and uh, The Monster. Uh, they are lavish, huge plays, but they had uh, many ethnic minorities in them represented on stage in a very dramatic and touching way. Yeah, a quick question to Mr. Riyad Dasmat. You were a Minister of Culture in Syria, October 2010 to June 2012. So you really bracketed the outbreak of the Arab Spring. Could you, would you as a writer and as a, have predicted that this thing would happen? That's a very sensitive question. <laughs> but uh, thank heavens I did not ban any play. <laughs> by any Arab playwright or, or foreign playwright. Uh, uh, truly, uh, uh, I haven't had uh, that experience. And uh, I did not want to bring this up. But uh, actually, uh, I was trying very hard uh, to produce uh, uh, some plays like Mirage Epic. And actually, we bought the rights uh, of it. I bought the rights from another playwright, the famous Walid Khlasi from Aleppo, for a very beautiful play, which I wanted very much to direct, and then I became a civil servant, and I couldn't. Uh, and I wanted also to uh, to produce, as a minister to commission, you know, somebody to direct uh, one of Muhammad Maud's plays, uh, uh, the Marsilies al Arabi, uh, a very old play which wasn't ever produced in Syria. Unfortunately, the three projects did not see light, not because of any censorship or panic. I was beyond, you know, buying them and bringing them uh, to, you know, directors to put them on. But there were differences between the directors and uh, the actors, etc. Some obstacles, and then uh, I quit. Uh, for my role, I always believed strongly that culture is there to unite the people, not to divide it. And uh, when it was very difficult to continue, I preferred to quit by my own will. And that's why I'm here now. When he had to censor his own plays, then he quit. <laughs> <laughs> Among theater artists, and perhaps even more particularly among theater audiences in the Islamic world, is there a division along Sunni and Shia lines? And in countries with significant Christian populations, such as Lebanon and Syria, is there a divide between Christian and Islamic audiences and theater artists? When a majority Shia audience go to see a play they knew was written by a Sunni playwright. Oh, absolutely. That's not an issue at all. 
And it, it's important to keep in mind with the countries that we're sort of focused on here have long traditions of, of secularism. I mean, certainly if we look at Syria, if we look at Iraq a little earlier, if we look at Lebanon, Egypt, I mean, a real commitment to, to secularism. And, and in arenas um, like Saudi Arabia, where that type of sectarian impulse would be a lot more above board, you're not going to have a theater at all. You're not going to have, uh, there are no cinemas, there is no, um, there is no public presentation of theater. If anything is happening, it's happening underground. Um, but I, I, I think that, that, that the, the rift we're talking about, it, it, I'm going to guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, that most theater goers would, would sort of eschew that sort of, um, I, you know, like a projection of religious identity would not be interested in that, or that would not be a concern, or that would not be a, a deterrent uh, if a Shia wrote a play or a Christian wrote a play. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not that well, usual. That's why I ask, because certainly non-Islamic audiences would not appreciate the distinctions between the branches of Islam, but Islamic audiences, Arabic audiences, follow Islam, might I mean, assume Art would. is a unifier. Uh, there are certain symbols, icons, um, if you're not familiar, for example, uh, singers. There's a Lebanese singer by the name of Feirouz. Uh, she happens to be a Christian, uh, but she sings uh, songs, poems written by many different people, uh, Sunni, Shia, whatever, Christian. She is a symbol. She unifies not just Lebanese of all sects, but Arabs of all sects. Uh, she, uh, she's a unifier across uh, all ethnic and religious uh, entities in the Arab world. Um, there are plays and there are uh, movies that uh, people don't ask who wrote them, but they are so popular. And in fact, there is a recent one, was it Lina Abiyad uh, involved in, called uh, And Now Where To? Uh, no, that's, uh, that's yeah. yeah, about a, a village which has Christians and Muslims, and they conspire to, uh, I think, to to cross bury people and uh, so as to unify uh, the village, and then somebody confuses the issue, changes the signs, and they don't know where to bury people anymore. And yeah. there's a scene at the end where they're taking them, and then they they stop. They don't know where to go. And they look at each other and say, now where do we go? Yeah. And that's the title of yeah. the film. And it was so popular, and everybody Actually, goes. Uh, and yeah, yeah, just mentioning Feirouz made me remember that we have also a Christian singer who in 2006 adapted a speech by Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, into a song. Oh. So you see such things happening. You know how it's, and, and I, I know we're Fouad and I think Sherry and I'm, I'm being told we have to wrap things up, uh, how we make an assumption in the American theater of liberalism uh, in terms of theater makers and maybe theater audiences that we, we tend to be more liberal, we tend to vote democratic in this sort of, I think in, in, the, in the Arab world uh, there's, there may be an assumption of a certain secularism. Uh, and, 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 and certainly a, a liberalism. So, you know, people are going to veer in a much more secular, anti-sectarian direction uh, in terms of our, uh, so, so we, we want to quickly uh, get to Fuad and Sherry and I need to wrap things up. Okay, I'm going to stay on the same topic of uh, the uh, intra-ethnic divisions in the Middle East. And uh, these definitely have some substance to them and they've been happening. But what we have to remember is that the, uh, the rules that, that the forces that rule, if not create this, they benefit from it. So that it's always been all these divisions that are happening, they keep getting fueled by upper political forces and things like that. And it became very evident during the Arab Spring that actually people, when they get together, this, those divisions disappear. And, and it was very, very clear in, in Egypt, for example, during the 18 days in the square of you know Muslims and Christians being together. And I don't want to plug my own work, or, or maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had a play that was actually staged uh, right here at um, Silk Road in December 2012 called The Night Jesus Joined the Revolution. And, and I reacted to the Arab Spring. That was my reaction. 
But I, one of the central themes that I wanted to talk about was how the Muslims and Christians got together and those boundaries completely melted when they were working together to restore Egypt to what it was. And when we were children living in Egypt, that didn't exist. So the, the divisions that are, that are now happening did not exist. And, and they happened because they kept the regime uh, in, in, in better control. And, and, a, and a lot of this Shia Sunni is sort of a geopolitical conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran that get, gets played out in all sorts of local arenas and, and aggravated and manipulated and, and is, is not so much about the grassroots. It's, it tends to be. Uh, Sherry. Thank you. First of all, Silk Road for hosting this and this incredible panel. I've, I've learned a lot in the last hour. Um, I was first introduced to Middle Eastern culture by an Armenian oud player, a friend of mine, who um, I fell in love with the music. He uh, introduced me to the Egyptian singer Om Kalsum, and um, it's very transportive. And then after that, I fell in love with the poetry, but I'm most ignorant about the theater, even though that's my background. And I would love to hear from the panel just about the general state of theater in as many Arab countries as it as you can touch on in this tiny last uh, segment, I just want to see kind of what the modern state of theater is across the Arab world, if, if you would care to comment. <laughs> just to make it last another hour. <laughs> well, so, I mean, certainly the upheavals of today and the sort of uncertainty and the complicated situations and places like Syria and Egypt and Iraq are going to have a, a, a limiting effect on how much is going to be produced. But, I, but by the same token, they're also going to have a fueling effect in terms of um, artistic expression and people needing that outlet for you know, somehow making sense of the insanity around them. And, and the countries that are absolutely not doing theater, Saudi Arabia, which countries are, or are not really presenting public the Gulf, yeah, I mean, the Gulf uh, doesn't uh, produce much at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia is almost a dark hole. Uh, but uh, Yemen, uh, which is the poorest Arab country, uh, is amazing and does uh, a lot. I think uh, I would say uh, Egypt is coming back after uh, a while of. Uh, <coughs> Under Mubarak for a while, things died down. When Egypt has a very rich history of uh, uh, comedy uh, and political comedy, and it's beginning to come back now. Um, I think uh, uh, Syria is, is, is going, forget Syria for a while, is going through uh, bloody hell. I mean, so it's going to be a while. Um, and and uh, Lebanon has slowed down because it's going through trauma. And it's going through. It has, it has a political movement that's very powerful that has no sense of humor whatsoever. <laughs> and so the Lebanese are losing their sense of humor, unfortunately. But there is still a, a serious uh, the theatrical movement going on despite it. Actually, uh, just before the so-called Arab Spring, Egypt and Syria uh, hosted international theater festivals. Wow. So one year I was in Egypt, it, there were more than 50 countries presented in the festival. Syria, same thing, very prestigious the, uh, theater festival used to take place. I think it's I hosted now. the last one. You yeah. did? Yeah. It's, yeah. Very it's very so well fun. attended. And same thing in Tunisia, actually. Cartage uh, Cartag Cartag Festival. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One thing we, we haven't mentioned in, uh, is Palestinian theater and, yeah. and also Israeli Palestinian theater and this sort of interplay, uh, which is its own sort of terrain and, uh, and, and certainly tradition uh, of, um, of, of resistance and also of reconciliation. So I, I think there are so many kind of pockets that are very specific to uh, local conditions or, or local environment. Um, uh, but we're seeing to, to the question about sort of uh, interfaith, intergroup, uh, there, there is some very interesting work being done by Palestinian and Israeli theater practitioners who are working together, which I think is, is really promising on, on and encouraging on a host of levels in terms of creating you know, dialogue and creating understanding and empathy and so forth. Uh, I, I want to thank um, 
big time. Uh, it's a wonderful panel for your, your time and your talent and wisdom and insights and generosity uh, sharing this with, with all of us this evening. I think this has been very inspiring. And, uh,